Let's crack open our Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 24. This is our last Sunday in the book of Luke. And I believe that God's going to have us go out of this book with a bang today. I hope everybody had a good week this week. I had a wonderful week last week. Got to go to Texas and be with my grandkids and my kids. And what a blessing that was, man. All right. Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 36. Uh, the title of the message this morning is The Importance of Understanding How Jesus Reveals Himself to Us. And, and I believe that understanding how Jesus reveals himself to us, it's critically important. Because if we don't understand this basic, uh, we're going to be looking for Jesus in all the wrong places, and ultimately, we're going to be let down. And the reason I think this is so important, because I can't tell you how many people I have watched look for Jesus in all the wrong places, and they're nowhere to be found today. Uh, that's why I think this is critical. You know, in, in today's world, it, today's world is full of deception inside and outside the church. Some people are looking for Jesus through concerts. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with concerts. The music and the people getting caught up in the perfect worship experience. But you know what? If that's all there is, or that's the ultimate, Dude, you're going to be limited in your relationship with God if that's all there is. And you know what? You know this as well as I do. Some people are just looking for love. But if that's all you're looking for, you might end up at the Mormon church. They love people a lot. <laughs> or if you're a little more discerning than that, you could end up in an emergent church where they'll show you love over the word of God and leave you stunned in your relationship with God as a result. So, how does Jesus reveal himself today? First of all, this may sound kind of strange, but he reveals himself through his body. Let me explain. Uh, the last time that we left off in Luke, uh, remember we left off with two disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, walking with Jesus unaware? And do you remember what happened? they finally realized that they were with Jesus and uh, they, they understood the word of God, it says, until it burned in their hearts. And Jesus stayed, and he had dinner with them that night, and then they went and found the other apostles to tell the story of what just happened. And that's where we open up in verse 36. <clears throat> it says, uh, <coughs> excuse me, while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. So while they were telling the other apostles about their experience on the road to Emmaus, I mean, you know, you could hear him, you guys, you wouldn't believe it. You know, he was telling us all about the word, our hearts were burning, and then all of a sudden he appears to them with everybody. And it says that they were startled and frightened, and they thought that they were seeing a spirit. So let's just stop here for a second, because there's an application here for all of us to take home in this verse. Jesus shows up in our everyday life. Uh, the disciples, they hadn't really got this concept down yet. And so what happened when Jesus showed up in their everyday life? They freaked out. They actually, it says they actually thought they saw a ghost. Couldn't be Jesus, not in everyday life. And you know what? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we are not so far from those apostles this morning. Uh, if the only time we feel close to God is at church, then you know what? We are really missing out. Now, if you would bear with me this morning, uh, I want to challenge you. And maybe you think I'm foolish when I ask you this, but I'm serious. How, how would you like to take Jesus to work with you? You might think it's a foolish question, and you might think I'm foolish by asking it, but I'm not. Actually, I'm really serious. Now, I have met Christians that are miserable on their jobs 
because <clears throat> they don't they don't understand this. Oh, thank you, Don. I've been fighting off bronchitis this week, so I I do feel much better. Uh, you're missing out if you're not taking Jesus to work. Uh, I've met people that take Jesus to work with them, and you know what? They're excited every time I talk to them. And the people that don't take Jesus to work, usually it's been my experience as I talk with these friends that they're bored. And they're usually stagnant in their jobs, and they seem to be self-centered, and they seem to be resentful. You go, well, resentful for what? Well, they feel like they're not appreciated. They feel like they should have been promoted. They feel lousy. And, 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 and their eyes have, have begun to be self-centered in, in, instead of God-centered because they're not taking Jesus to work. Listen, the people that take Jesus to work are looking for ways to minister to people at work. They pray for their bosses. They pray for their coworkers. And they also pray for the success of their company that they're working for. You would not believe what happens to companies that have praying employees for the success of their company. The Holy Spirit begins to move in business and it's absolutely fabulous to watch. Also, these people that take Jesus to work, they're looking for the miraculous. And you know what? They find it all the time because they're looking for it. I think back of one of the times I had the lousiest job I ever had in my whole life. <laughs> what was I doing? I, I was cold calling a salesman selling copiers. Listen, if you want, I hope there's no copier salesman in here. <laughs> if you want a bad job, that's it, man. It's straight cold calling, you get no hot leads, and good luck for you, you know. And uh, I had just totally failed after about three months, <clears throat> and I began to pray, and I began to ask God for the supernatural, and I'll never forget it because I got with the sales manager in the LA office, and I, I just said, look, I'm doing all these demonstrations of these copiers, man. I'm, I'm talking, you know, 15, 20 a week, and I'm closing nothing. And he goes, I want to get with you for two days straight, eight hours a day. I'm going to teach you how to close. So he taught me how to uh, deal with seven no's. I mean, somebody that said no seven times, you know. <laughs> and really, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And so I learned a little bit, got some wisdom, and I went out there. It was Oh, about a month before Christmas, and it was my <clears throat> first cold calling after my two days with my LA manager on closing. And I just prayed for the Holy Spirit to do something miraculous. And I said, Lord, would you throw me a bone today? Would you show me that you're real in business? And so I walked into an insurance company, and I'm just telling you that day I was so wired in the spirit, man. I walked in there and they knew something was up to me when they saw my face. They go, what do you want? <laughs> and I go, well, I go, I, I came in today to sell everybody a copier. Everybody. And there was five offices in that, in that place. And when I said that, I said it pretty loud. And all five people came out of their five offices and I sold all five of them a copier that day. <laughs> it, it was so awesome. I, it was everything I could do to contain myself not to jump when I went out of that building. But all I know is when I drove back to the office, all I could say is, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You're so real. This is so awesome. You work in everyday life. But most people don't take Jesus to work. Now, do you know what I'm talking about? You're on your own. And when you're on your own, it gets depressing. That's kind of where the apostles were. Uh, 
the, the apostles really weren't looking for Jesus. That's why he startled them. They thought he was a ghost. Verse 38 goes on, and he said to them, <clears throat> Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. Man, don't you love that about Jesus? He just came to help him. Look, I'm not a ghost, man. Put your finger in my wounds, Thomas. Put your hand in my side. Dude, I'm as real as it gets. He's so helping them. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. You know when something so good happens to you, you just go, I can't believe this, it's so good. They, they never thought he'd really rise from the dead. And they're going, he's back, he's with us, he was right, he didn't forsake us, and he didn't leave us, and we thought he did. And I know there's people here this morning, you thought Jesus left you, and you thought he forsook you, and he didn't. He's going to show himself to you. I believe he's going to do it today. And, and, and it went on. This, this experience of seeing the body of Jesus, and it, and it says, do you have anything to eat? Man, this is as real as it, as it gets. Let's go do lunch if you think I'm a ghost. Ghosts don't eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. This, this really is an awesome revelation because uh, Jesus actually uses his body to help their faith in believing. And you know what? Jesus knew that, that sometimes we need a live person to encourage us and to minister to us. As we were talking in our Saturday morning's Bible study yesterday, you know what? Sometimes when we're bummed out or, or, or we're just facing it, we need somebody with skin on to talk to us. You know what I mean? And nothing else will do. I don't know what it is. And Jesus knew it that day. It's why he showed up in person with a body and he ministered to him just like he was. So Jesus used his resurrected body to minister to his disciples back then, but what does he use today? Because I'm telling you, we have the same need that the apostles did that day. We still need a live person to encourage us. And it's obvious that Jesus isn't still appearing uh, in his resurrected body to everyone on earth, is he? Has he appeared to you recently, physically? If so, I want to talk to you. No, just teasing. <laughs> but you know what? He still uses his body to minister to us today. But the way he does it is through the church, the body of Christ. Now, the Bible says that the church is, is a living body, and it says that Christ is the head of that body over all things. So Jesus reveals himself through us, the body of Christ. Now, back then, he put some skin on and went and saw his men because he knew nothing else would do. They needed a live body. And he hasn't changed. He could, you know, he could communicate through people by renting a blimp and, and doing uh, sky passes with messages on it to us, you know, personally. But that's pretty impersonal. He doesn't do it that way. He, he reveals himself through us. And look, whether we're a believer or not, when we're hurting, it doesn't matter if you're a believer or not a believer, when, when you're hurting, you need somebody with some skin on to hear you out. And, and the Bible says that he's given each one of us gifts so that we can touch others with with the love of God. So what I'm trying to say this morning is God wants to use you. 
He, he's given each one of us gifts to go out there and touch people with, with the love of God and, 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 and to encourage people. And, and people still need a live person to be lifted up. Now, I know that the church has been criticized for being hypocrites and, and that all of us have seen the imperfection in the body of Christ if we've been around for years. Oh, maybe we've seen church splits. Maybe we've seen politics. Maybe we've seen things in the church that is worse than we've seen in the business world. Who knows what has happened to disillusion people with the body of Christ. But you know what I say, you guys? I say, let that go. You can't hold on to that. Man, if you hold on to that, you're holding on to a root of bitterness. You'll never be able to be used with a root of bitterness going on in your heart, especially over the body of Christ. I think we need to refuse to swallow Satan's view of the church. Because believe you me, it's a jaundice view. And by that, you, you know, if you have jaundice, it, it means your eyes are yellow, you know? And so everything you see when you're jaundice is yellow. It taints your whole world. That's, that's what bitterness and, and a negative attitude towards the body of Christ happens. This is a place, and I'm talking about our church here. This is a place where we take sinners and we lift them up to see and let them taste that the Lord is good. And I'm just telling you, I myself, I love the body of Christ. Well, I know we got a bunch of sinners because I'm one. And, and you see, I know that God's called us to walk together and, and to not just put up with each other. That's not what God's called us to, to put up with each other. You ever seen a marriage like that, where people have committed themselves to put up with each other? And then they get old and crotchety and cranky, and you don't want to be around them because they're putting up with each other? Uh, some people view the body of Christ that way. I don't. I love the body of Christ. And, I don't know, God's put it in my heart I am out to prove that our church is still in the business of showing the lost, the limited, the lacking, and the lonely that we really care. And we want to be God's skin. We, we want to be the ones that will touch you when you walk through this door. And in short, God's using us, the body of Christ, to reveal himself to those who are discouraged and to those who have given up on the church. And, and, and when I say that, there's kind of two groups of people that have given up on the church, the, the, the non-Christians and the Christians. Now, you know what I'm talking about if you work in the business world. or You, you, you can see what a negative view the world has on the church. Uh, They've almost been ostracized and, and, and minimalized and written off as a bunch of illiterates. And they have no idea what's in this church. They, they have no idea what the love of God tastes like. And we're on mission. We're on mission to bring people in and to give them a taste that God is good. And... Uh, the, the, the other side of that coin are the Christians that have strayed from the faith, that have been hurt in the church. Surely you know some or you are one. I know so many, so many hundreds people that have been hurt in the church and that have never come back and are resentful at best, bitter at worst. And I believe that we need to be on mission to reach out to those people to show them that God still works in the body of Christ and that, you know what, this is the best thing that could ever happen to you. You don't believe me, all I have to say to you is come and taste. Come and taste and, and see that God is good <clears throat> because once you taste the love of Jesus Christ, 
you're going to be back. So how does God reveal himself to us today? He reveals himself through his body. Secondly, he reveals himself through his word. Back to our passage there, he's just shown his body to his men, and verse 44 says, and now he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So what Jesus is talking about here is all things that were written about me in, in the whole Old Testament. Uh, you know, the, the Pentateuch was the first five books of the Old Testament, and the prophets are broke down into the major prophets and the minor prophets, and then there's Psalms and Proverbs. So the whole Old Testament. And what Jesus is saying, men, I am throughout the Old Testament. You'll find Jesus in every book of the Old Testament. We see him as the Passover lamb in Exodus. We see him as the power to release the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. We see him as the great high priest in Genesis and the priest and king Melchizedek. We see him as the lamb of God in Isaiah 53. And we see him as the, uh, the lion of Judah in Ezekiel. And verse 45 goes on, it says, Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> listen, we live in a world that's so uh, relativistic that People are making up their own version of who God is. I would like to challenge you, maybe at work, at, at, at the lunch table, or out and about, if you have some non-Christian friends, just ask them, who do you think God is? Oh, you're, you're just going gonna, gonna to be floored at what they have conjured up to be God. Because every man has conjured up God to fit his own sin life. That, that's basically what what is going on. Now, because of that, there's no absolutes. Listen, if there was absolutes, it would drive them to Jesus. Uh, so, truth is whatever you want to make it up to be. And lying is accepted if it advances your version of reality. Wow, do you ever see that in the political world? Just asking a question. The reason people have such a warped view of God is because they have not come to know the Word of God. And the Word of God is the only stable rock that, that, that we can hold on to. Um, and, and the point is, if we're not relying on God's Word for truth, uh, we will believe anything and everything from our government and, and, and from our world leaders. We'll have no discernment because everybody's reality is what they have conjured it up to be. And so you can be led away by every stray false doctrine that, that, that there is. And so why is the word critical? What, what, what is in that word that gives us stability and helps us hold on to the truth about God? Hebrews 4.12 tells us. It says the word of God is living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it says, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow. You ever thought about what that means? What, what do you mean it, it goes all the way through, through the skin, through the muscle, through the bone, into the marrow? What it means is God's word will pierce through all our rationalizations. Now, we can put up many walls to God, especially over years, and, and we can feel pretty safe with the walls that we have around us. Oh, but God's word has the power to pierce through all those walls of rationalization and go all the way into the marrow of our being. Whoa, what a heavy thought. And then he says, it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So when you're understanding the intentions of the heart, there go the rationalizations out the window. If your intention was to hide from God, you understand what I'm saying? The word of God will get through that 
and it'll, it'll convict us. It says, and there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom with we have to do. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, which the world holds, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. So the word of God is a powerful reality uh, because literally the word of God is Jesus. And let me explain to you why I say that. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 explains it. It says, in the beginning was the word. Now, what John is doing is using the word that we're reading as a description of Jesus. And when he says, in the beginning was the word, he's, he's giving the word uh, a godlike substance, substance of never being created. God always was. You'll never figure that out, so don't even try. But he always was. And it says the word was, was with God. Mormons get completely confused here. Now he's talking about Jesus. The word is Jesus here. It says in the beginning was the word. He always was. It says the word was with God. I had somebody ask me recently, well then how could he be God if he said he was with God? Because we're talking about God the Son being with God the Father and God's a triune God made up of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says, there it is, and the word was God. He always was. He was with the Father from the beginning. And the word that we read was God. Thank you. So, you know, what we're talking about here, when, when, when we're reading the word, we're talking about the mind of God. And so you can see how you can get misled in the world, especially with <clears throat> all the satanic forces and the driving effect to, to, to take this place where we don't want to go someday, called the Great Tribulation. And the Word of God is the only help that we have. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's another thing that's extremely hard to explain, as I tried to explain that to my seven-year-old granddaughter last week as we began Genesis together. And she was asking me, she goes, well, uh, what, what, what do you mean there was nothing? And I go, you know, Lizzie, that's such a good question. I'm not sure that you're ever going to understand it completely. But there was nothing here. Just God in the beginning. And he created all this from nothing. Only God can do that. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And in him was life. You, you know, Jesus and the word is life. Zoa in the Greek. And, and all these things have come into being and made living through God. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but this is the sad part of the story that still exists today. The darkness did not comprehend it. And so, the word is so important to us. Now, we can saturate ourselves in the word, but I'll tell you what, God never called us just to do that. We, we, we don't want to get ingrown, self-centered, and, and, and stagnant. Yes, we've got to digest the Word of God and take it in and be stable, and then we have to take it out. We're the only live people that are going to give a message to anybody out there. We, we have to care. We, we, we just have to put our emotions aside because there's a whole world out there that, that, that is on their way to the kingdom of hell, which is a, a burning place of punishment that, that goes on forever. It, it's just not talked about anymore from the pulpit. But we, we, we have to believe what God has told us about this place called hell. 
There's no stability in hell. There's no light in hell. God is light. Now, although they'll be burning, there will be no light from the burning. And for all those people that told you that they want to go hell because they're going to see all their friends there, they're so naive. Maybe most of their friends will be there. They won't be seeing any of them. They're going to be completely in outer darkness and blind and burning in torment, the Bible says, in about six different places. And, and, and the hardest thing that is going to be able to be conceptualized in that first day in hell is that 100,000 years after that first day, a million years after that first day, they won't be one day closer to getting out. Talk about no hope. That, that's a kind of depression that will just wrap you up and contain you forever. Sometimes it's good to be reminded of what happens when you reject Jesus Christ and, and the wonderful gift of life that he gives to us. That's why it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. So the least we can do is be the skin that God wants to use to take the good news out of, listen, you can get out of this mess. You, you don't have to go through anything. Look, God's, God's done something through his son that, that's not only going to release us all and, and give us a right to eternal life and go to heaven forever, but you're going to have the richest life you ever thought about living right here. Wait till I tell you about the spirit-filled life. Wow. So if you're hoping for eternal life in heaven, the only chance you have is to get a hold of the Word of God, uh, uh, read it, and, and, and pray that God will reveal it to you, and, because it's the only way that we can understand true repentance. And it's not just salvation. Now, the, the, the Word of God explains something else uh, ab about what it does for us that's really important. It's in the Old Testament. It's in Joshua. Even, even if you expect to acquire any success in this life, you know what? It's going to come through the Word of God. At least that's what Joshua 1.8 says. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. The very best way I know to be prosperous and successful is to go to the book of Proverbs and just keep reading that book. It's just full of wisdom. The guy that wrote it was the smartest man that ever lived, had more wisdom than any man ever had, and was more successful than any man that uh, was written about. So how does, re how does Jesus reveal himself today? He does it through his body. He reveals himself through his word. And he reveals himself through his proclamation. Verse 48. Remember, Jesus is with his men again. He's made this personal appearance. And he says, you're witnesses of all these things. Remember, he just got through talking about how the Old Testament explained who he was and what he was going to do and what the outcome was going to be. And he goes, you guys are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. There's that people with skin again. God's not into using blimps to give his message to us. He wants to use live people. Now, they were privileged to see a personal account of Jesus face to face, and Jesus wants to use them to be a personal account of his great promises to them. So what's the promise of the Father? That when we repent and we come to Jesus, all heaven will be opened up to us, and, and no sinner is too wicked, and no one is turned away. We, we get to personally hand out hope in, in a world that's in chaos. Uh, we, we, we get to be his message with skin on. We, we get to be the personal touch of Jesus Christ. 
Romans 10, 13, Paul wrote and said, Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? Look, if we don't go out and tell somebody, they're not going to get it. They're not coming to church, you guys. i got bad news for you. There's, this is a big negative thing about church because they've never experienced it. They don't know what a spirit-filled body of believers is. They've never tasted to see that God is good. And it says, how will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? We're the preacher. I'm not the preacher. You are. Praise God. And how will they preach unless they're sent? So I'm officially sending all of you today. Well, I don't know where you're going, but you're going back to work, and you're going you know, back to your families, and you're going back to your neighbors and your friends, and you're a light. Look, we don't necessarily have to take the entire gospel message to somebody. What God's doing is he wants us to get sensitive to the Holy Spirit that when God wants to say something through you and you feel him tugging on your heart that you're willing to step out on faith and open the door so that the Holy Spirit can do his work. And he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. But Jesus gives us a caveat in the passage here uh, to be in his messenger in verse 49. He says, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So I believe the message that Jesus gave his disciples that day is the same message that he's given us today. Look, don't bother taking the message out until you're clothed with power on, from on high. So what does it mean to be clothed with power from on high? Uh, Jesus was pointing out the ultimate importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the commandment to stay in the upper room in prayer until the Holy Spirit filled them on, on that day of Pentecost. Now, we already know, as, as we've read in previous passages, in, in Matthew, that the apostles already had the Holy Spirit living in them, but they weren't experiencing the power to be witnesses yet, to be Jesus in their skin. So what happened when the Holy Spirit empowered them that day? Now, some people like to concentrate on the gift of tongues that, that happened that day. And, and people, you know, understood them in their whole language. But there was something far more important than the languages that were spoken that day. What happened is they were empowered with the Holy Spirit. And one of the biggest failures amongst those 12, Peter, got up. And he preached a message that was so fiery, 3,000 people got saved. And if you read the account in Acts, it's so exciting. It's one of the fieriest messages you've ever read. He says things in there, and it was you guys that killed him and put him on the cross. Whoa, are you kidding me? That's the word of God just piercing right through you. Remember we were talking about the word of God is sharper? than any two-edged sword, and it'll pierce through all our rationalizations? Well, believe you me, they had a lot of rationalizations when they put him to death. It was his fault. He was a phony, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, Peter, Peter preached that message, and bam! Oh, you know, it went through three or four walls of rationalization, and what happened? Did they get mad at Peter? No. They said, what do we got to do to be saved? The same thing's going to happen today. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and we go out and empowered by God and his word, just get ready for something supernatural. It wasn't just Peter. All the other apostles were so empowered, they spent the rest of their lives preaching fiery messages, and each one of them gave up their lives as a martyr. That's what I call power. It was drastic. Everything changed that day. The, the, the church was launched into the world, and it was never stopped. Here we are, 
and, and Satan has tried uh, five million ways to stop the church through the earth, but he hadn't been able to do it. It's still alive and well today, and that same power that, um, in, in, that was endowed to them at Pentecost is the same power that, that we get today. But if we dare go out without the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll just be doing it in the flesh, and we're going to be powerless. It doesn't work, make a long story short. Has anybody tried that besides me? I, I have. I've tried going out without being prayed up and, and just been battered around out there, you know, and come back all bleeding and everything, <laughs> and emotionally, you know. And then, you know, I finally realized that I needed to get serious about the Word of God, and I needed to get serious about prayer, and I needed to get serious about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and then it's totally different. Then you go out with God's power. So, how do, does Jesus reveal himself to us? He reveals himself through his body. He reveals himself through his word. He reveals himself through our proclamation. And finally, he reveals himself uh, through his promise to return. So, Jesus, he's given them their mission to take the message of hope into the world, and he told them to wait for the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 50, he says, and, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. Listen to this. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So after Jesus blessed them, it says he was lifted up into heaven and it says that the disciples were, were worshiping him and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we may not really understand why they returned to Jerusalem with, with great joy unless we go over to Acts 1 and see how Luke fills in the blanks here. So the reason they were excited is they knew Jesus was coming back for them. You know how excited they were when, when he showed up that day. They, remember, they, first they thought he was a ghost, and they were, they were so excited they couldn't believe it because it was like all too good to be true. And then he told them that he was coming back. Yeah, he's coming back in, in bodily form, just like he did that day. And the Apostle Paul gives us an account of how this is going to happen in 1 Thessalonians 4.14. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, those who have died in Jesus. In other words, the apostles. And everybody else that has been Christian that have died since Acts chapter 2. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This isn't something Paul thought up. God told him this. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, or in other words, those who have died. We're not going to go to heaven before everybody that's died as a Christian when Jesus Christ comes for us. The dead in Christ are going to raise up first. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's why these guys were excited. That's why they were going what I call church, synagogue, every day. And they were excited because they knew they weren't going to be left behind. They saw him. They tasted that God was good again and they believed him. They were rejoicing that he's coming back for me. And you know what, you guys? I'm telling you. There's a whole deluge of, of bad theology against the rapture today. Really put forth by the emergent church and many of the mainline denominations. Uh, as a matter of fact, the rapture is looked on with disdain and we're mocked for believing in it. And, and I say, why is that going on? Well, I believe I do know. Because Satan wants to give us a jaundiced view of God. Just like he did with Eve in Genesis, so he's going to do again, and he's doing now in these end times. 
You know, you remember what he did with Eve in Genesis. He, he asked Eve a question to make God look bad. Remember what it was? Hey, Eve, did God tell you to not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? No, no, he didn't say that. He just said this one. So what was Satan trying to do? Have you ever seen anybody do that before? Where, where, where they try and paint a bad picture of somebody? It's what Satan does to God all the time. He started in Genesis. He's doing it today. And today's, today he's saying, you believe in the rapture? How naive. You know, you're just not mature in your faith. If you were mature, you'd realize that we go through trials in this life and that we're going to have to go through, you know, some, some great suffering here. <clears throat> and uh, you're just immature in your faith. You know, you can't handle life, so you keep praying to get out of here. That's your problem. That's what they're saying. But, but you know what? I, I, I don't think those pseudo-theologians have a clue of what kind of wrath is coming this way. Now look, there's wrath, and then there's God's wrath. We can get a little picture of God's wrath when we go back and we read uh, the prophets in the Old Testament. We take a look at how many times God warned Jerusalem to wake up, stop honoring these false gods, and come back to me. And the things that happened to Israel were so atrocious. Uh, when Nebuchadnezzar came with his forces, they starved that city. They, they, they made people end up committing cannibalism. Moms and dads were eating their kids. I know this is gross, but it happened. Many of them were slaughtered. It was a horrible massacre, and all because of the rejection of God. And, you know, you go to Daniel 12, and Daniel 12 says, when the great tribulation comes, there's never anything that's ever happened on this earth that has ever been this horrible from the time that history began. When you think, well, what about World War II when the Nazis slaughtered all those Jews? It ain't nothing to what's coming. That's why I say I don't think these pseudo-theologians understand the wrath of God and how horrible it, it would be to be a sinner in the hands of an angry God. Wow. So <clears throat> the fact is, Jesus was revealing himself to them through hope. His apostles were back in Luke. He gave them hope that he's coming again to get them. Well, he's coming for us, too. Remember, Jesus already said, look, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. Uh, he won't leave us because he's promising to come back to get us. Listen, even if we're not going to be in the rapture, there will probably be quite a few of us that die before the rapture. I don't know. But even if, if I, I have hope anyway. <laughs> Look, if, if I die before the rapture, the book of John tells me that Jesus has made a mansion for me, and, and the, the moment I die, it says he's coming back for me personally. And he's leading me to my mansion. So he's not forsaking me. He's not leaving me. I got hope, and the world doesn't have hope, and I'm so sorry for them. But they can't steal my hope. They may hate hope. I don't know. <laughs> I'd say I don't care, but I do care for them <clears throat> because I don't wish that on, on anybody. You know, th the best way I, I, I can describe this is uh, with maybe an illustration of what's going on in South Sudan today. You know, I don't know if you knew it or not, but the last three months, South Sudan has had a civil war within itself. Now, there was a civil war between North and South Sudan for 24 years. And so they separated and became two different countries two years ago. But now South Sudan and, and the individual country itself went into a civil war. There was a coup. And the vice president of that country 
got an army with, with one of the uh, richest states in South Sudan and started uh, attacking uh, the main leaders in South Sudan. It, it's been a horrible situation. A lot of people have been killed. Hundreds of thousands of people have been misplaced. Now, our chaplains that we've been training for 15 years are right in the middle of this. Um, We've had three chaplains killed in the last three months. Uh, we've, we've had 12 chaplains uh, injured. So this is, this is pretty serious business. But I can tell you, my friend, my dear friend, Wes Bentley, that started, <coughs> excuse me, Far Reaching Ministries, I talked to him the day after Christmas, and uh, he left two days after Christmas to go back to Sudan in the middle of the fighting. And he, he already told me he was going to do this anyway. He goes, I know war is coming. Uh, the, uh, the Joint Chief of Staff, Commander Momul, said that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, uh, because he knew what was going on. And he goes, I know that God's called me to go back there. And so Wes went back there and he went to the front lines in a place called Bor, uh, where the worst fighting is. And the reason there was fighting at Bor is because it's the most oil-rich uh, place in South Sudan. And South Sudan is extremely rich in oil. That's what most of this battle is over. And, and, and so he was there in, in the midst of the fighting, up on the front lines. And when one of our chaplains, Peter Akesh, I know Peter personally. He was one of the first chaplains that graduated from our first class about 15 years ago. A real warrior. Just, uh, and such, you know, he's such a committed man of God. He carries his cross wherever he goes. I mean, literal cross. And, and he's, such, he's such a warrior that he, he's the only guy I know that found a cobra in his bedroom. And so what does he do? Slams the door shut and it's him and the cobra. And he has this walking stick he has, and he just pops him on the head and kills him, you know? So that's the kind of guy he is. And, and <clears throat> I guess a week and a half ago, Peter got shot. He got, he got shot in the hand, and a hand grenade blew up by him, and he got shrapnel all over him. But you know what? Wes was there. And Wes had him medevaced, into Uganda, into a good hospital, and saved Peter's life. And uh, I, I was just so stoked. And I know those chaplains. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years myself. Uh, I, I don't live there. I, I, don't, I don't pretend to be a, a major source of what's going on there. But I have had experience there, and I have talked to the men a lot. And I can tell you, every time I leave Sudan, I always have a couple chaplains come up to me and kind of sheepishly ask me this question. Uh, Pastor Steve, are you coming back? <laughs> they all want to know. We don't even know why you came here. I don't think we would come here if we were you and lived in America. How could you leave America and come here? And, and, and we keep saying, because of you, why do you think? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I want to train you up and send you out, man. And when they saw Wes at the front lines, you know what they were thinking. They were thinking, oh, wow, it's our leader. He didn't abandon us. We thought for sure when this war finally broke out again, especially as bad as this is, we'd never see Wes. Wes fooled him. Not really. He, he told him that he'd be there if war ever broke out. It's where he is right now. That's the way Jesus is to us. He knows that we're in a battle here on earth. And, and this is the hope that he left his disciples. He's coming back. He's, he's going to be there in, in, in the midst of it all. And maybe you feel like God has abandoned you this morning. And I can tell you nothing is farther from the truth. You know, it, it may get bad down here, but... One thing for sure we know, he is never going to leave us. He, he's coming back for you. And I, I hope to be able to personalize this this morning of helping you realize that 
I'm not necessarily talking about the rapture, although that's true too. I'm talking about the moment you leave your body here, Jesus is going to be right there to grab your hand. He's taking you directly to your new home. Isn't it neat that he's personal? See, this whole message this morning and, and the whole passage is all about being personal. Jesus knew he had to be personal with his disciples. He knows that he needs to be personal with us today. And he's called us to be on mission. Not go on a missions trip, but to be on mission right here where we're at, right in our work, right where we work, right at home, right with our neighbors. So how does he reveal himself today? He reveals himself through his physical body to his apostles, and he reveals himself through us, the body of Christ. He reveals himself through his words so we can understand who God is, and he reveals himself to the world through our proclamation. And he reveals himself through his promise to return for us. Let's pray. Boy, Lord, if there was ever a passage that we needed more, it has to be this one, Lord. In an impersonal world that we live in, God, I guess the calling that we've seen this morning, Lord, is probably one of the, the most important aspects of what you've called us to do. You want to shine your light through us, Lord. You want to be able to touch the world through your love. You want to be able to touch the world with the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we, we say as the prophet did when... God said, who will I send? And the prophet said, here am I. Send me. So, Lord, it, 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 it's our prayer this morning. We want to say the same thing the prophet did. Lord, here am I. Let, let me be your mouth. Let me be your skin. Let, let, me be, let me be that person so somebody can see God again. Because this world is getting dark, Lord. And we do want to be the light. So we say, use us, Father. And, and God, I, it's my personal prayer that you would fill this entire building here, Lord. Through the love of God that's going to reach out through each person here. So we ask for you to do mighty things through us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.